Well, thank you everybody for being here today to uh, uh, hear uh, Governor Bullock. Uh, I'm Eric Palmer. I'm the county chair here in, Mahas in Oscaloosa, Mahaska County, Iowa. You probably did You're going to make me spell that all. No, you're right. That's what you know here. Yeah. Uh, and we're also, we have a, another guest, Attorney General of the State of Iowa, Tom Bullock. Say a few words at the end, but you've also endorsed the governor. That's right. right. That's right. I wanted to make sure we got that. I've got a whole sheet of information. I'm going to keep Get all the plugs you can. I, oh, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I'm going to make this very quick. Uh, I see that you're the governor of Montana. Montana is a very Republican state, and uh, you've, been ma you've managed to governor as executive in a state that's mostly Republican. So that's kind of a that's no small trip. So I wanted to make note of that fact. That's, that says volumes about you. Uh, the other thing, you've been very involved in getting what they call dark money out of politics, and that's an issue near and dear to my heart. I think all of us need to know who's trying to buy our elections, and when, when billions of dollars come floating in and we can't trace it, that's a problem. Because people like us can't afford, we don't, we don't have any, my hundred bucks isn't going <laughs> to, isn't going to match Adelson's hundred million. Okay. And at least we know where that came from. That's right. We want to know where the money comes from. I know you've been very active on that particular issue. Sure. So uh, I'm going to uh, leave it up to you. I promised I would be brief. Thanks. Governor Bullock of Montana. Thanks, Eric. Also, thank all of you for coming out on a hot and sweltery uh, Friday morning here. I know that you get a few candidates to come by and they try to make some attenuated connection to Iowa, so not going to tell you, I just left a Tomahawk where my mother was born. <laughs> <laughs> or that my great-great-grandparents settled in Henry County in 1850, or my grandparents graduated from Iowa Wesleyan, right? But that's not why we're here. We're here for the sake of our country, for the sake of our country standing in the world, and for the sake of what we're going to pass on that next generation, we're here to make sure that Donald Trump's a one-term president. Yeah. <laughs> I think folks gather for more than just that, though. It's also to soundly reject the behavior that he's normalized. And we see that more this week than, I'd love to say, any other week, but we've seen it time and time again. From the lies and the misstatements are the dividing us by race, by gender, by geography. It's no exaggeration to say we're now getting to the point where we expect more out of our preschoolers than we do the President of the United States. That's not the example we should have. <coughs> Folks want more though too. I mean, as I've, I've been in this about seven weeks and we'll talk about why I wasn't earlier, but as I've traveled around Iowa, a whole lot of folks say, you know what, they're working harder and they're making less. If you look at it over the last 40 years, about 60% of Americans haven't had a pay increase in real terms. Or as you live in a rural county, like I do, two-thirds of the counties in this country have lost businesses over the last decade. You shouldn't have to leave your home or your church or your community just to have a decent living. Or for your parent, back in the early 70s when I was being raised, 90% of 30-year-olds were doing better than their parents were at age 30. Today, it's only half. So the economy's not working for everybody, and they look to the political system for relief. And as Eric suggested, it is captured by that dark money. When you see environmental laws being gutted because that's what the oil companies ask for. Or you think about for the Citizens United case, 2% of all outside spending was from groups that didn't disclose their donors. This last midterm it was over half of all the spending. So it's no surprise in some respects that folks are anxious at times. They're frustrated, they're angry. But instead of doing something, Donald Trump's poured gasoline on that fire. We are more divided today than any time in my lifetime. Forget about cable news, forget about Twitter. Can't even have conversations at times around Thanksgiving dinners or at a coffee shop without politics dividing us. And that's not the promise of America. We're better than that. Look, I background was raised in a single parent household from just grade school through high school. Uh, live paycheck to paycheck. 
only knew that there was a governor's house in town that you saw on the tour train. I only knew it was there because I delivered newspapers to it. So I've made it four blocks in life from where I was raised. You know, I was just raised right, the tour train didn't go by it. You know, but I worked my way through college, I borrowed my way through law school. I'll never forget that day that my wife and I paid off what would be $175,000 in today's dollars of student debt. And yeah, it influenced the decisions that I could make, but I still had the shock from going, from delivering newspapers to the governor's house as a kid, to raising my three kids in it. We gotta recognize for a whole lot of folks, that shot no longer exists. There's a lot of people in this country that that shot never did. So yeah, it's about beating Donald Trump, but it's also about making sure that this economy, this democracy can work for people so that they believe that they can have what all of us want, is that's to do better than the generation that preceded us. I think we gotta be clear-eyed about this. And you folks in Oskaloosa where Trump won by 45 points, you see it in ways that other people don't always. That if we don't, at the end of the day, give people a reason to vote for us, not just against him, if we don't change our strategy, and if we can't win back places that we lost, we gotta be clear-eyed that he will win. I think it can be done. I've seen it done before. In 2016, I was the only Democrat in the country to get reelected in a statewide race where Donald Trump won. He took Montana by 20 points. I won by four points. 25 to 30 percent of my voters voted for Donald Trump. And there's a lesson here that we can't write off places in this country or the state of Iowa just because we didn't win last time. A third of your counties went. Obama, Obama, Trump. <clears throat> Instead of writing out those places, we gotta say, why aren't Democrats connecting there right now? And I don't have the luxury in Montana of just saying, well, let's go to all those pockets where it's really blue. We gotta go all over that state. And I think we gotta make sure we can connect all over this country as well. You know, when I first got in and I looked, there's get that there's like 37 people running at this point, something like that. You know, I uh, announced in uh, my high school classroom, well, the one that I was in that my kids are still now in, are going to school, and then I came to Des Moines and somebody said, oh, it's great that you're in, but what took you so long? Like, on the one hand, you'd love to think it's still 200 days before Ion's actually caucus, so there's still a long time to go. But I had a job to do. Uh, my legislature got out about the same time years in Iowa did. I had to get Medicaid expansion reauthorized. And if I had to choose between you know, chasing 100,000 donors or getting health care for 100,000 people, easiest decision I've ever made, for sure. But I do believe, even in a divided time, government can work as I've seen it. My legislature is more Republican than yours. Yet we've been able to get things done, like passing health care, passing the most progressive laws when it comes to kicking dark money out of our elections of any state in the country. We've made record investments in education. Our colleges have frozen tuition for six of the eight years, but that meant actually investing more money into higher ed. Well, as in Iowa, you're taking more money out. We have the fourth lowest tuition fees in the country. We've taken our two-year colleges, our community colleges, which you actually have, I think it's eighth highest tuition even to the two-year colleges. But we've made it not just about a degree, but about a professionally recognized certificate or apprenticeship. Somebody can make a decent living while they're gaining a skill or trade. As a result, we got more people climbing into the middle class of Montana than any state in the country. So I try to find common ground with those legislators, but that doesn't mean you have to compromise your values. I have more vetoes than any governor in the history of Montana. <laughs> you know, I've stopped every attack on a woman's right to make her own health care decisions. <laughs> Look, at half of the states in this country have actually made it harder for people to vote, disenfranchising. We've protected access to the ballot box. We've also protected access to the courthouse for injured workers. We've kept our public lands in public hands and vetoed every attempt to roll back opportunities for clean energy along the way. And as a former union side labor lawyer, I've stopped every attempt to strip away the rights to organize and collectively bargain. Yeah. How 
I win and how I govern are much the same. Like I'll never forget when we were trying to get Medicaid expansion through. This was this was 2015, <coughs> first time. And that was the heart of the anti-Obamacare time. Went to this town called Shoto, Montana. Shoto is about 1,700 people. It's along the Rocky Mountain front, and literally everybody in town knew that I was coming to Shoto because the Koch brothers were nice enough to mail these big mailings with a picture of Barack Obama and Steve Bullock on them to every household and say, Bullock and Obama are coming to your town to destroy your health care system. But I showed up anyway, right? Instead of just telling them what they need, I listened. The first person that talked was, uh, he was a hospital administrator. He said, you know what, 43% of the people who walk through these hospital doors don't have health insurance. A couple people got up afterwards and next and said, you and Obama are destroying America or something like that. Probably the fourth or fifth speaker, uh, you know, he's this grizzled old rancher. He wasn't even from Shoto. He was the chair of the county commission. He's from a town called Bynum. It's population 50. It's kind of a suburb of Shoto. <laughs> but he got up and he said, you know what? I was born in this hospital. This hospital saved my life two years ago when I had a heart attack. If we lose this hospital, this town's gone. So instead of me telling them what they needed, me letting them get the politics out of it, that's what allowed their Republican legislators the courage to defy the Koch brothers, defy party leadership, vote to expand health care when every vote mattered. We went from 20% uninsured to 7% today. We haven't lost one rural hospital. And about 20% of rural hospitals in this country are at risk of closing. And when you look at what's happened to your Medicaid system, as it's been privatized, we've actually made it so it can provide greater opportunities. 30,000 Montanans have gotten mental health treatment as a result of that. That's how government ought to work. I do think that D.C. could teach or learn a few things from Montana. I know you say, oh, Montana, it's just a small state somewhere out there. <laughs> A little bit bigger population than states like Vermont or Delaware. I'm just <laughs> suggesting you think about that. But I also think that unless we're willing to address one of the things that holds back DC in so many ways, and that's the toxic influence of money in our elections, we're not going to get any of the things done that folks are talking about. Think about it. Lindsey Graham literally said, we got to get this Trump tax cut through to make our donors happy. At the same time, 44% of Americans wouldn't have 400 bucks in their pocket. <laughs> in case their car broke down, or they had a medical emergency. Are you looking, we pay more for prescription drugs in healthcare than any country in the world. We've got nothing to show for it. The drug companies are invested in big in our elections. Generational workers have been replaced by independent contractors. Same time the union membership's half of what it was in the 1980s. Or oil companies, Chevron didn't pay a nickel in taxes last year. We're making good profits. Republicans can't even acknowledge that climate change is real. <laughs> so until we can address that part of the way that money's influencing the system now, it's going to be that much harder to get any of these other things done. I believe we can. I've seen it done. I was Attorney General with uh, Tom Miller when this little case called Citizens United came up. <coughs> Citizens United, if you don't know about it, it said, essentially equated people with corporations and money with speech, saying corporations can spend as much as they want to influence our elections. And there's nothing we can do about it. Every state in the country, when that case came down, said there's nothing you can do. Game over. Or even think about it, at the time we controlled, Democrats controlled both House of Congress and the presidency. We gave speeches about it, we decried it, we said it's horrible, but we didn't do anything. Montana had this dark history where there were these wealthy copper miners, copper barons, we called them the copper kings, that literally controlled every local, state, and federal election. It was even beyond Montana. Mark Twain talked about Montana and he said, you know, this one of William Clark buys politicians like most people buy food. <laughs> uh, and he said, because of Clark, corruption no longer has an offensive style in Montana. Like early 1900s, a newspaper said, the greatest living issue confronted us today is whether the corporation shall control the people, or the people shall control the corporations. So regular folks said enough is enough. They passed by initiative this act called the Corrupt Practice Act that made it so corporations couldn't spend or contribute in our elections. All of a sudden, elections became, I'll be dang, 
about voters and about people talking to people, not about unlimited spending and outside influence. We also have some of the lowest limits in the country. So when Citizens United came down, I said, I can't give up on the last century. I was Attorney General, build a case to take to the U.S. Supreme Court. I got testimony from former Republican statewide office holders saying just what the threat of this spending could do to what happens at our state house. First case up, really excited, 5-4 decision, U.S. Supreme Court throughout 100 years of Montana history. Taught me two things. One, don't ever doubt what one Supreme Court justice can do when it comes to our democracy, when it comes to women's rights, when it comes to workers' rights. But it also taught me that that doesn't mean you can just give up on the system. So I went back to my legislature, which was about two-thirds Republican at the time. We passed this law that said 90 days out from election, I don't care if you call yourself Americans for America for America, I don't care what it is, you can't spend in our elections unless you disclose all that spending. And I'll never forget, it's probably 92 days out from my re-elect in 2016. Americans for Prosperity, the Koch brothers, did these mailings. They didn't really target very well, because even my house got one of these mailings. <laughs> and my children pick it up and go, Dad, are you really that bad? <laughs> but then on day 90, day 90 for the election, it stopped. And if we could stop the Koch brothers in Montana, we ought to be able to stop them in Iowa and Washington, D.C. and everywhere else, for sure. This is the most important election of my lifetime. And yeah, it's about beating Donald Trump, but it's also about preserving this 243-year experiment called representative democracy. And I know that those running for office often fill the world with hyperbole, but I truly believe that's the case. We've got to be able to win back places that we lost. We've got to be able to give people a reason to vote for us and not just against it. We've got to make people believe that both the economy and Washington, D.C. can work for them. I'm an optimist. You have to be with three young kids. <laughs> but I think that that's also part of who we are as Americans, right? We know we're actually at our best when all voices can be heard, not when we're fighting in these warring camps, or when civility can replace anger, or everybody, no matter who their parents were or where they came from, believe that they can do better along the way. And I think we can become this country again. And about 200 days from now, it all starts right here. You guys are entrusted with an incredible responsibility, and you always have been. You take large fields and you win over them. So I ask for your consideration. I know that there's this Iowa nice, where everybody says, yeah, well, you're on my list. <laughs> is your list that big or is it this big? I'm hoping by the end of it, I'm somewhere up at the top of that list, not just somewhere on that list. Because we can be a better country than what we are today. And we also can win back a little dark secret that not every candidate will tell you. Come February, we all leave. You go, bye-bye. <laughs> and then you've got still a legislature that's stripping away collective bargaining rights of your teachers, stripping away the rights that women have, stripping away your, the way that you apportion your legislative seats, making it harder to appoint fair judges. So we've got to not only win this presidency, but we've got to have somebody at the top of the ticket that's going to help you turn the 30 of those counties that you lost in 16 so you can make sure that you have a legislature that's going to work for you, not for others. I think we can do it. That's why I'm in it. Thanks. I'd be willing to answer almost any question. <laughs> Before he answers all those questions, except maybe one, uh, let me just jump in and, and, and for just a minute. Then. First of all, thank you for all you've done for me. I feel so lucky to be Attorney General of your state many, many times to use the law to serve the interest of ordinary Iowans. And wouldn't happen but for people like yourselves that keep getting me elected, and thank you. The other thing I want to mention just quickly is why I'm, I'm supporting Steve. Um, it's because of what I call sort of the the package of qualities or the boy package 
And in the package are these. Um, I've known him for about 12 years and, and know him well. We, we work together a lot as attorney generals. And he's a man of immense character and integrity, just the highest possible level. And, you know, I think Washington just demonstrates now that, that that's really important. He's an enormously able guy. He's bright, he understands, he understands politics, he understands public policy, he understands people, he understands how it all works, how government works, how politics works, how you do things, how you accomplish things. Um, he has great judgment, uh, judgment about political decisions, about what to do in office. He always does the right thing, uh, even, if the, even if there's pressure of one type or another to do something else, he always does the right thing. He's sort of where I'm at uh, in, on, on issues, sort of a mainstream liberal, mainstream progressive. Um, but for me, the clincher for him in, in that package is his ability to connect with people. He, in my opinion, connects with people better than anybody I've seen come to Iowa in the caucuses, except, of course, for Barack Obama. Uh, and that's why, that's why he does so well in Montana. He listens to people, he understands them, he connects with people. And that is incredibly important, we found out last time around. And it's going to be incredibly important this time around. And let, let me just leave you with, with this thought, um, that you know, I am very proud to, to be an Iowa Democrat. Um, but also, I'm, a, I'm somewhat worried Iowa Democrat because of what is the way the state is trending. <coughs> and I believe Steve is the person at the top of the ticket that can best help us move the state back into the Senate, move the state back to, to, to the Democrats, win, win, the win the House, keep our three, let, three members of Congress, maybe win the Senate seat, really do well. And I say that he can do so well at the top of the ticket um, because essentially he's done it before. He's done it three times in Montana under very similar circumstances. He does well in rural areas. He does well with working class people. He does well in the cities. Uh, because, as I mentioned, that great quality to connect with people. So um, I ask you to, to give this guy real thought, to give him real consideration, because uh, I think he's got that package of qualities. I think he can help us as Democrats. But most of all, those kinds of things that we talked about would make him a terrific president, and that's what we desperately need. And thank you again for helping me. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Miller. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I'm Phyllis Weeks, and I'm from Knoxville, which is Marion County, a little bit west of here. We hope you come to Marion County as well. Uh, to With that uh, invitation, I yeah. promise I will be in Marion County yeah. before this is all over, Phyllis. <laughs> we have a great venue. Uh, we have a craft uh, brewing uh, tap room that. Even at like 9 a.m.? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> maybe, we'll, maybe we'll do that one later on. So <laughs> that, well, then I have three things. Uh, my second thing is this Iowa nice business. <laughs> Iowa, can, there, yeah, there are some nice people, but basically, <laughs> Iowa can be polite, not always nice, and you only have to look at the bills that came out of the legislature. No, that's right. You're not nice to women, not nice to public schools. You're absolutely so right. We're very careful. About yeah. Number three. What is the overall democratic message? Uh, I went to a parade in a small town, and uh, our Democratic Party had a truck with 22 signs on it, stuck on it, you know, any way that they could get the things to stick. Um, but, you know, it, what, it whizzed by, and I thought, wait, where's the message? And so, what is our message? Because the Republicans attacked us on their Facebook page, their Marion County Facebook page, and they said the Democrats don't get it. And I have to agree with them. They want to make America great again. So what is our one message that we can all uh, yeah. use? Um, yeah. I don't know what it is. That, that, and thanks for the, both the question and the statement, Phyllis, that um, and I think you're really straight on as far now I, when I say Iowa nice, I mean folks coming for something like this. But what's happening in the legislature could set Iowa back a long way. <coughs> and there's so a guy named Mo Udall, who was a congressman in the oh, yeah. 70s, you know, he ran for president and then he didn't win, but 
during the national convention said, yeah, when Democrats organize a firing squad, we usually do it in a circle. <laughs> so we're really good. At, look, look, at the same time that this administration spent the last two and a half years trying to rip health care away from people, trying to get rid of coverage for pre-existing conditions, we start fighting about, even though presumably we all agree that health care should be accessible and affordable. When we look at so many of the challenges in our immigration system right now, those challenges are taken care of by getting rid of Donald Trump because he's ripping not only families apart, but he's ripping our country apart. So I can't, oh sorry, go ahead, clap, please. <laughs> so I can't give you necessarily all of the Democrats' message, we have great diversity, but I'll give you my message is making sure that this party can connect with people's everyday lives. And that often begins with those issues like, if you get outside of politics, not everybody in this world tunes in and cares about this, right? But I don't care if you're a Democrat, a Republican, a Libertarian, a Vegetarian, most people want the same things. You want a safe community. You want a roof over your head. You want a job that you can be proud of that might even give you retirement at the end. You want clean air, clean water, good public schools, a place you can do better for your kids and grandkids than ever you ever have. So the Democratic Party ought to be about giving a fair shot for every individual, no matter who they are, who their parents were, or what part of this country they live in. And it begins with some base economic issues, because it's hard to care about everything else if you're worrying about if my car breaks down, I'm not going to be able to get to work. And then we can tackle so many of the other things. There's incredible energy this time and this cycle. But we got to be focused on making sure first that we beat Donald Trump, then we can get the economy and democracy working for so many of others of us. Yes, sir, back. Yeah, Mr. Conroy, I'm sorry. Governor, I think it comes down to, you guys are all qualified, everybody we've seen. The one I'm going to support is the one that can say, why did these people vote for Trump? I think it was all fear and anger. I won't, forget all the issues, people don't vote on that. They want somebody they feel good about. It's like FDR says, we have nothing but fear to fear. I want somebody like you, and I think you can do it, say, people, don't be afraid. I've got you. I can be the Moses to take us into the century, this new century. And the rest of this is all of Well, that's a little bit of pressure. Now I can be Moses! <laughs> yeah, I want you to be, I want yeah. you to get up on the, you need to be a preacher, man. Yeah. Because people, there is just a groundswell. People will just come forth. They're so waiting for this. It's fear and anger that he got yeah. elected by. Now, That's all we have to do is quell the <coughs> fear and anger. The rest will solve this. No, and, and I do agree with parts of that, that a whole lot of the folks did vote because of fear and anger. But I also think that we as Democrats got to be careful. Like when I first got reelected, I was asked to travel quite a bit. And um, when I'd say 25 to 30% of my voters voted for Donald Trump, often I'd hear, what's wrong with those voters? Are a little skeptically like, What's wrong with you, Polik? <laughs> like, never what's wrong with us when there's a whole lot of folks that we should have been connecting with. If they were voting their economic interests, if they are voting their health care interests, if they are voting their education interests, they would be with us. So we can't make this big, big sort of characterization of this is everybody that voted for Donald Trump because the people that voted for Donald Trump are the people that you go to church with and sit here in a coffee shop. So we've got to give them a reason to believe that government can work in a way that's going to lift people up and give better hope and but better you, opportunity. Man. You're the, you are government. They don't want to know anything about D.C. They want to look in your face and say, that's my man. That's my lady. That's my guy. That's all it is. And I think that hopefully, I mean, one of the things in this field of 37 people or whatever the heck it is now, you have a little bit different perspective when you're not in Washington, D.C. I mean, when we talk about health care, I hear about health care when I take my kid to the Target because somebody's going to walk up to me about it. This isn't about speeches or plans to go into a press release and go, don't go further. This is about impacting people's <coughs> everyday lives and making them believe government can work. That's why I'm doing this thing. Yes, sir. Uh, Pat, here in Austin. Okay. I'm a lifelong resident. Um, I guess when I was a youngster, it was don't oh, trust anybody are. over 30, right? Don't trust anybody over 30. Now that I'm near over 30. 70, uh, I have trouble trusting anybody 
you know, that's over 30. I really don't. I only trust people young. I'm 28. Younger. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know Medicare and, and all those are Medicaid. Healthcare means so much to my generation, obviously. I just got a $400 bill, you know, yeah. this morning. But the kids, the young people, the youth of this country, the, I'm amazed at the passion that came out of four years ago at the caucus. It was kind of just Bernie and uh, Mrs. Clinton. And I noticed wonderfully groups of older women who, for a lifetime dream of a female in the White House, wonderful thing. I happen to be with the Bernie group. We had almost every young woman yeah. in our group. What, what do you speak to the youth, to this, this energy? Because I don't want to see them, uh, it, A, lose. You know, at, at no, yeah. time. Oh, yeah. Or B, even worse, even worse, more dangerous to this country, is if we defeat Trump, but we come up with the same old, tired policies of the centrist yeah. Clinton era, yeah. and and the, the, the brush just keeps building to yeah. make the next guy, the next demagogue, who won't be stupid, who won't be a buffoon, you know, who will be dangerous. Yeah. And we want to keep the young well, people appealed to is dangerous. There's no... Yeah. The buffoon in the White House is very dangerous. Oh, they'll be, but but they'll be someone to come along really who who, who understands the well, level of bullet. Yeah, we're in a pretty dark. But the young people, yeah. what you know? Yeah, so shall I tell a story people. then I'll give the answer. So so I'm sitting in my, like the FCC repealed net neutrality, right? So you can then block and throttle and charge different things. I'm sitting in my office, and my assistant comes out and goes, uh, "Steve, your daughter's on." And Caroline was 16 at the time. And I pick up the phone and say, hey, Caroline, what's up? <coughs> she called through my main switchboard. She goes, governor? Uh, <laughs> I am in trouble. And she goes, FCC just re repealed net neutrality. Go, yeah. Well, I just called both our senators and our congressmen. I'm like, did you use your last name, honey? Uh, but, but, but then I said, then she said, what are you going to do about it? And at first I said, well, not much I can do. I'm a guy. <coughs> now, the only thing worse than disappointed constituent is disappointed teenage daughter who doesn't think you're very cool anyway. So we started thinking about it, right? And we wrote this executive order that said, if you want to sell internet services to the state of Montana, you have to preserve net neutrality for every Montana. Now I get that Montana might not be the market maker for the entire universe, but then I put that executive order into a template and encouraged other states to do the same. Next day, two little tiny states are called New York and New Jersey <laughs> signed that same thing. So in part, I used my daughter for a generation if 18 to 30 voted at the same level, 55 or 60 out, every single election would be decided by them. First, we've got to be able to hear them. Just like I had to hear my daughter and not just say, no, this can't be done. I had to find a way. Then we've got to recognize what are some of the concerns. Look, George H.W. Bush, the first Bush, when he was in the White House, said, we're going to address the greenhouse effect with the White House effect. Meaning a Republican president said, we've got to address climate change. 30 years later, Republicans can't even acknowledge that climate change is real. And now we are to the point that we've got to do something. I hear that a lot from that generation. I hear a lot from that generation of, we need to make sure that this is about keeping communities safe. This is gun safety. I hear a lot about that generation. They want to make sure that they have a voice in D.C. Part of that goes back to the same corrupting influence of dollars that kicked them out. we got to figure out every single way to engage them and get them excited along the way. Because the truth is, you said you're in your 70s. Okay, I'll admit I'm not 28. I'm 53. But they've got a lot more at stake in this election than we do. And we've got to make them understand that they do have that stake. We need folks engaged. Now, 55 is kind of my cutoff point. <laughs> 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 I'm feeling better with you now. <laughs> this one more. Oh, last question I'm told. Just following up on that comment, what, how are you engaging young people in conversation? Obviously, these sessions 
could, because it's the middle of the summer, we could see young people. Yeah, mo mo most of the time, you guys are all talking, I'm just staring at you. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. How do we get yeah. young people engaged in this? No, and, and, and I think that we have to. Like, I have 25 field staff on the ground here, and we're building that out. We're all trying to get folks actually bringing them in and having individual meetings. The great thing is, like, if you signed up here, chances are somebody that works for me is going to call and say, hey, I'd like yeah, to talk right. to you more. I'm, as I'm the over college, 55. As the college has <laughs> come back, I think it's that much easier to engage young folks along the way. Well, they yeah. They're out working. Yeah, they're actually yeah. trying to make it, you know, not everybody can skip out in the middle of the day. So, but I think that, and also talking to, about both some of the issues and some of the ways that they believe that they can have a voice. I think we have to do that. And I think part of it too, and I'll close, um, and it's how we present and what we decide that this whole thing's all about. When I first got elected uh, to governor in 2012, we move into the governor's house in January of 2013. The time my kids were six, eight, and ten. It had been forty years since kids that young had been, you know, part of the governor's family. And I'll never forget my son Cam. He kicks a soccer ball and bounces off this painting. <laughs> Somebody says yeah, that painting's worth two hundred thousand dollars. I'm like, well, then get rid of all the damn paintings, right? Because we got to live here. But my first day of the state, and we're deeply divided. Our legislature was. I talked to these legislators about, um, <coughs> you're going to hear some different sounds out of the governor's residence and even the governor's office now. It's the sound of young kids. And we as elected leaders, representatives, got to recognize that our kids learn from our words and our deeds. What we say and what we do matters. And I said then, our kids are watching. <coughs> I believe that more today than ever before. And as we present this, we got to ask ourselves, are we giving something for that generation to aspire to and be inspired by? Look, someday, one of these days, that's the president's going to have to answer that question. Maybe a long time from now, but he will have to. Every one of us running is going to have to answer that question. What are we building and are we giving something for that next generation to believe? And I think all of you that make the decision of taking a large field and making it much smaller need to have that in mind as well. We can be better than what we are today. And we can do what every parent wants to do, is give that next generation a better life than they have. That's why I'm doing this. That's why on your big list, I hope I can get up near the top. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I have an interest in that, even if I'm 90, because I paid my first student loan in 67, 1967. Yeah. And I feel for them. No, yeah. And I would like to see whoever gets in do something to help them. Um, I, I agree we need better education, but we need kids and have got their education to be able to live. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and there are, and only for you after I said no more questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I wanted to get that in, and good luck. The students need service, and I hope you can cover some of this at that time. Yeah, uh, thank you, yeah. It's a week from Tuesday, we'll be on the debate stage, and looking yeah, forward to it, for sure. Um, look, I think in what you've seen in so many different ways when it comes to the student debt crisis, like it is horrible that student debt has doubled in the last decade, right? And you look at so many people have been paying for 20 years and are still paying just on the interest, not even giving the principal. So you can do things like you can crack down on the Trump universities and the fly-by-nights to allow actually more money into the system. You can go after these debt services you can figure out ways to make it easier to pay off student loans. You also look at the last decade, 
46 states have decreased their investment at the state side by 20 percent. Montana wasn't one of them. So we're also at the same side pulling back our state investment. But I think that we, as we do this, we also got to recognize. So I think that there's more you can do to make student debt manageable. But we also got to recognize that there's 68 percent of this country that don't even have a two-year so don't have any college, and you can't, you also have to allow accessibility and opportunity for them along the way as well. Thanks again for having me, for sure. So what are we doing now? So we'll just spin around. Oh yeah? <laughs>